Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the, to the first talk. So as Joe said, um, Joanna and I will be talking about how Bureau Happold has in, embraced digitization. So I'll just crack on to that. So the first, the first thing we're going to be covering, I'm going to cover um, how Bureau Happold uh, has embraced digitization. I'm going to be talking about our, our strategies um, and also a little bit of the initiatives we do. But first, I'm going to kick off with why the digital why digital skills are necessary and what, what is the need for them and are, are they necessary. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we approach it uh, as Bureau Happold ourselves. So for some context, Bureau Happold is a small to medium sized business is 17,000 employees worldwide and we're largely focused in the UK with about 800 to 1000 employees, but we also also spread across the globe. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we aim to bridge the gaps for new starters, the majority of which are graduates coming through university, and how we look to kind of bring them up to speed in, in terms of computational skills, uh, and how we can also uh, expose them to some of the work we do. And then Johanna is going to give us a really nice uh, user story about her development at Bureau Happold and really reinforce all the different things that I've been talking about, making reference back to them. Uh, and that, that's probably going to be the, the most exciting part of the presentation because there's going to be lots of lots of project work and lots of really cool innovative stuff that she's been working on. So firstly, why is digitization important? So there's kind of there's really three reasons that I'm going to touch on. Uh, and the first is model complexity. So when I'm talking about modeling, I'm talking about analysis models, um, BIM models and anything using to represent um, the, the structures that we're building. So at Bureau Happel, the nature of our work just means that we're working on generally quite complex projects. So you can see a whole host of them uh, on, the, on the screen there. Um, there's bridges, there's buildings, there's stadia. Uh, you can see um, some of the connections from the, uh, the Morpheus City of Dreams Hotel in the top right, the Lil Langerbro in the bottom right. And basically, uh, with clients demanding more complex structures, more iconic structures, the way in which we uh, model them and uh, design them is going to become more complex. So we're going to need to use more sophisticated tools to represent them. That's the first point. The second point is process complexity, and that naturally follows on from model complexity. So if the structures that you're designing uh, are becoming more complex, then the processes uh, and the procedures which you're using to design them are going to become more complex inherently. So this is an example from the Lil Langenborough Bridge, and this was looking at the temperature gradient, which is quite important as it was a movable bridge. So there were um, there were connections between the different spans, and they needed to have a number of different tolerances built into them. So, as I'm sure you will have been aware, there have been a number of instances in Copenhagen of bridges becoming locked, and that's because of movements under thermal um, thermal loads, and they essentially jam. So it was, it was something quite important to design. But because of the nature of the geometry, it was really um, difficult to apply design standards uh, and design codes to this. So we basically had to go all the way back to first principles, do a shading study, look at the sun's position throughout the year and at, at different points uh, of the day, and, and then manually apply that into, um, into the analysis model. And, and that's just one example of process complexity, but the same thing could be applied to building physics. You know, as the geometry of the buildings become more complex than the uh, calculations and design that is required is going to become more complex. And the third reason for embracing digitization is problem complexity. And I'm sure you've all been aware of the various institutions, the different companies, charities, all declaring a climate emergency. And there's a need to look at the bigger picture. And so to do that, you need to have things represented in the way that you're able to move information around freely and also be able to analyze that, whether it's looking at embodied carbon, looking at full life cycle assessment, uh, digital twins, positive feedback loops, and so there's a, there's a need and a desire to have everything represented computationally rather than how we've been working previously. So that's, that really covers um, the why. And so now really just looking at, at how we do it. And so I mean, this is our approach at Bureau Hubble. This is what works for us. And I, I'm not preaching gospel uh, because obviously all firms are different and there's gonna be different approaches that work. But this is what we found works for us. Uh, and the main thing that works for us is having a comp collective rather than a specialized team. So some, some uh, companies would prefer to have a, a siloed computational team that does all their computational work. Um, but the way we've approached it is to have that collectively spread across our offices, one, because it works ge geographically, but also uh, because uh, we're a multidisciplinary company. So we have a number of different specialisms. The other thing that we've done is we've developed a set of computational competencies that requires a, a minimum level across the company. 
So just to show it to you diagrammatically, there are four different levels. Uh, there's knowledge, experience, and ability. So that's aligning with the institution's objectives. So knowledge being a, an appreciation, experience being able to do something with supervision, and ability is being able to do uh, that task independently. And the idea is that from graduates all the way up to your directors, managing directors, all the way up to partner level, is that there has to be this base level of understanding for computation within, com within the company. And the idea is that uh, there is an openness to digital tools throughout the company. So, you know, when you go to your director or, or project lead on a, on a project and you say, oh, I want to do something computationally, they're not immediately skeptical because, um, skepti skeptical because they have that base level of understanding that, you know, they'll be able to, uh, you know, allow you to implement that onto your project. And then the other thing is that as uh, individually, you're then able to road, uh, have, a, have a roadmap and a, and a way of um, setting your own goals for your development throughout your career. So you might be someone that says, well, I only want to only want to have that appreciation. You know, I don't want to focus on the computational stuff too much. Well, that's fine. You can sit at the, at the base level. Or you might be someone that says, well, I want to use these tools, but maybe I don't want to develop them. And again, that's fine. You'll be able to implement them projects. You'll get all the great benefits of it, but you won't be driving the development. Or you might be say, I want to go all the way to level four and I want to be someone who is on the cutting edge, developing these tools, contributing to open source libraries and uh, implementing them on the biggest, most complex uh, and most iconic projects. And yeah, the idea is that there's, there's that full range, uh, but they're all covered and, and covered by that minimum level. And so just to give you an idea of one of the competencies, so this is the, the entry level, this is the base that we expect from everyone. So an appreciation for the potential for computational engineering and design, process automation and optimization, and to have an understanding of parametric design in the context of engineering. So that is the base level that we expect across every single employee at Bureau Happel. And so at the final, final point that I'm going to talk about before we go into Johanna's uh, user story is uh, the number of initiatives that we use to bridge the gap when new starters are coming in, so predominantly uh, graduates. And so there's a number of things that we do across the company uh, obviously, it was a bit easier pre-COVID, but it is what it is. Um, so one of the main things that we do um, quite regularly, and this is across different locations, uh, are hack nights. So you can see in the top left there, we've got uh, a hack night in London. There's one in the middle in Mumbai. Uh, and essentially, the, the idea of these hack nights is that it's a melting pot for like-minded people to come together uh, to develop uh, some computational tools, but also to be supported by people with, with that knowledge uh, and allow you to brainstorm, bounce ideas off different people, uh, and also just work on something uh, computationally. Um, we draw down a lot from uh, an R&D wish list, which we, uh, we compile throughout the different teams as well. So people put in ideas of what they want, and then on the hack nights, you can essentially, if you want, go pick, a, pick an idea from the R&D wish list, and then you can develop that. The other thing that we do are uh, hack academies. So these are annual events and the idea is it's kind of like the first year of university where you're trying to bring everyone up to the same level. So we go around the different offices around the globe uh, and we have a number of talks, which you can see in the bottom. I think that's one in, in, in Berlin. And there's a, a number of different uh, events where we're uh, explaining and describing different things uh, computationally to all the new starters and we're exposing them to what we do. And then there's, an, uh, there's normally a few hack events as well where they, can, where they can test things, get their hands dirty and do some development. And it's really to show them, again, that kind of breadth of, you know, do you wanna be someone that just has that appreciation or do you wanna be all the way up to someone that is able to develop these tools? And I think, yeah, we've, we've talked about this a few times at Bureau Happel. And I think the main, the main uh, kind of takeaway we've had is that the, the most important thing about embracing digitization is constant knowledge sharing. So we do so much within, within Bureau Happel, but also externally sessions like this. Um, so you can see in the bottom there, the BIMNARs have been going quite strong over the pandemic, even got a, a fresh look of paint for the branding. But there's all sorts of um, talks that we host and uh, we're constantly share, sharing that knowledge across the practice and also externally in industry with some of the open source initiatives that we, we contribute to. And I, I know this is obviously a, a conference facilitated by the Institution of uh, Structural Engineers, but it's also worth mentioning that this, this is spread across, across the entire practice. So, you know, the city's business is well involved with the, the digital workflows as well. And then this is just to show you the level of engagement in uh, some of the Yammer groups we have. So we have a computational collective Yammer group. Uh, this is a place where people can share their own development. They can ask questions about things they're working on or using. 
uh, or they can just share what's going on within industry. So you can see a, a nice, nice upward trend. And given the size of our company, it's actually, a, yeah, I think it's a fair, a fair reflection of, of the people that are involved in, in that kind of computational aspect. And this last graph is just showing the, uh, the, the messages read. And again, similar, similar metric just to show that level of engagement. So I'm just going to hand over to Johanna now. She's going to talk through some of her experiences at Pure Happold as a, as, a, as a placement, but also during her professional career as a structural engineer. So I'll hand over to Johanna. Great. OK, so hi, uh, everyone. I'm Johanna, and I will be trying to map out my progression in computational design in parallel structural engineering from university until today. So just to give a little bit of a timeline, um, I did a bachelor in architecture and engineering at Chalmers uh, University in Sweden. And then after that, I took a year out and did a year in industry placement at Pure Happold in Bath. Um, then did the first year of my master at an Erasmus exchange in, at IPFL in Switzerland, back to Chalmers for the final year of my master's. Um, and then started working at Bureau Happold as a graduate structural engineer in 2018. Um, so just going back to university, um, during our bachelor course, um, computational skills and particularly sort of mathematical modeling of geometry was built into several of the standard engineering modules. Um, and this was initially mainly in MATLAB in the calculus modules and then later on um, in the second year, starting to look at visual programming. And in the third year, we had uh, an elective course, which went deeper into visual programming and also object oriented programming, but still um, sort of mainly focusing on geometry and structural engineering applications. Um, and during the presentation, I will be uh, referencing back to the computational competency matrix that Peter showed and try to map out my progression on it. Um, so this would be where I was at after finishing my bachelor before doing the year in industry. Um, I did my placement in the sports and lightweight structures team, uh, and that's also where I work today. So there will be a lot of sports stadiums. Um, during the first half of the placement, I worked on um, the geometry generation for the new Tottenham Hotspur uh, football stadium roof. So here on the left, just some of the geometrical setting out rules and the section through the model. And on the right is the final structure from 2019. Um, and working on this really allowed me to sort of uh, develop my visual programming skills a lot, while at the same time just trying to learn as much as I could about um, the structural design of cable nets. Um, and then during the second half of the placement, among other things, I got to work on the bid for another cable net roof, um, which was uh, a really good way to then sort of build on what I had learned during the first half uh, of the placement, but now start also looking at the structural analysis, comparing different uh, options to each other, and also generating um, the final Revit model for the bid. So this, uh, going back to the computational competency matrix, this would be uh, where I was at after the placement, which, uh, which really shows, I think, how beneficial it was to do a placement. Um, and doing a year in industry placement, it's not part of the degree at Chalmers, um, but it's something that they actively encourage you to do, um, drawing inspiration from the architecture courses where that's more common. Um, and for me personally, I found it really useful, not just for computational skills, but also just to get an insight uh, into the industry before going into the final years uh, of the degree. Back at university for my master thesis, I had the opportunity to uh, design a timber grid shell uh, for a conference stage at the Wooden Technology Conference in Gothenburg. And this was a really useful exercise in um, that allowed me to put into practice a lot of what I had learned um, in taking a structure from design through analysis, um, detailing, fabrication and finally uh, assembly. And I think maybe that project didn't necessarily advance any of the competencies, um, but I think it was a great way to consolidate a lot of the knowledge that I had gained up until that point and 
link it directly to practical engineering applications before starting to work as a graduate. Um, so after finishing my degree, I started uh, as a graduate structural engineer at Bureau Happel, uh, and using the tool already, tools already available within the company, um, such as the BOM, uh, which is the central coding library, which is also uh, open source, um, and also the experience from doing a year in industry. Um, it was actually quite straightforward to pick up the computational workflows that were used on projects um, to automate some of the more repetitive tasks such as analysis model generation, Revit model generation and feedback loops between the two updating section sizes, etc. Um, at the start, um, this would be sort of picking up workflows set up by other people and later on setting up my own project specific workflows. Um, this is an example of generating loads based on tributary areas calculated in Grasshopper and then pushed into the analysis software. And then the Revit model generated from the same Grasshopper model with section, section sizes from the analysis model. Uh, and this would then be a snapshot of the matrix around the end of my first year as a graduate. Um, and then in the next step, um, I started to add um, add to the bomb where the functionality that would be useful on a project maybe didn't already exist. Um, so early on, that would be just adding one or two lines of code to um, a method that already existed, and later on more um, extensive bits. Uh, recently, I was working on a cable net roof where the cladding was rather suddenly changed to fabric. Um, and due to the nature of the cable net, we were driving and regenerating the model frequently through Grasshopper, but at the time we didn't have uh, the functionality to create fabric uh, elements in the BOM. Um, but the project, uh, the project leader had uh, quite extensive computational experience, so he could see that it should both be possible within the time limit and also worth investing the time to set that up and then both for this project and then to have it going forward. Um, and I think for me, at first, that seemed like quite a daunting task. Um, but being able to build on what's already in the bomb, you can do a lot of sort of copying things and then changing things around. And um, being able to discuss with other people in the computational collective, it was actually um, fairly straightforward to add the objects and methods necessary to set up the fabric functionality. Um, I started with just regenerating um, the model from an online fabric tutorial for the analysis software, which um, served as a good checking method to make sure everything worked as it should, and then moved on to the fabric cladding for the project. Um, and this is just an intermediate step where I hadn't defined the support conditions properly, but it felt like quite a big success just seeing it behaving as a tension fabric. Um, and then this is uh, just one bay of the final structure with the fabric cladding on it. Um, and here's the matrix again, then representing moving further along the programming skills during the last two years um, while working on different projects. Um, and finally, since starting at Pure Happold, um, there's been a wide range of computational knowledge sharing sessions, um, like the ones that Peter mentioned, um, which I have found really useful. Um, more recently, I've been involved in delivering computational training to the bot structures teams uh, together with two of my colleagues. Um, so this is a snapshot from one of the lectures. Um, and in parallel, um, we set up a local teams channel um, for people to just on a more local scale share what they've done and ask questions. Um, and this has been a really nice way to start feeding back to the community. Um, that's it for our presentation. Uh, thank you for your time. Hope you found it interesting.